break. The next stop, we will be at the trenches. So we are doing good. So more than two thirds is behind us. We are already climbing the pyramids. You can see the same slope below us. And who would say that only one meter below us, below the soil, is actually the structure with the concrete block. You're going to see them in a minute. Now, I'd like to get your attention and then uh, uh, let's take a look around us. It's a beautiful nat nature. When spring, summer, fall comes, everything is green. Now imagine this place without those buildings. We had forest. Generally, when you have forest, you have food because forests come with the animals. Below us, straight, you can see the river. That's the river Fornica. Another couple of hundred meters, River Bosna, the biggest one in Bosnia. In prehistorical times, we had not two major rivers, but four of them. So it's plenty of water. Again, when you have forests, you have construction material. So we have all the elements for the civilization. Food, construction material, water. And a very pleasant climate. Now, until 12,000 years ago, we had an ice age all over the planet. Everything north from Austria was covered in ice. So now today is Germany, France, Poland, Scandinavia, UK. Only ice. And it was reaching up to 3,000 meters, almost two miles. But everything south from Austria, no ice at all. Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Greece, Turkey, southern Italy, Spain. Now, the temperature was 3 degrees less in average. Like I said, very pleasant. According to the anthropological genetics, which is a new science developing since 1990s, through the DNA testing, we know exact migrations and age of all nations and societies on the planet. We know that the oldest people in Europe were Basques, 55,000 years old. Basques, even today, live in Spain and southern France. The second oldest cultural oasis in Europe was the Central Balkan region. And we are in the center of the Central Balkan right now. 38,000 years. The third oldest, Ukraine, around the Black Sea, about 28,000. So we can see that those, true, that those three societies were all located in southern Europe. After the end of the last ice age, 12,000, 10,000 years ago, when uh, the climate was much better in the mid and northern Europe, people from southern Europe started migrating to north. Today, 60% of Norwegian, Swedish people, Danish people have haplogroup, have DNA from people from southern Europe. So really, it's not like that uh, the culture, the civilization came from north to south. It's opposite. <clears throat> it went from south to the north. However, what they teach us in schools in Bosnia, in Croatia, in all the southern countries, is that the civilization really started with the ancient Greek, ancient Rome, and so on. Civilization is much, much older. Yesterday, when we were in the tunnels, I was showing you the conglomerate. Remember those stones, pebbles, rocks, sand, of different colors and different sizes. Well, they used that to make the concrete blocks you're going to see. All they needed was a binder. And as a binder, they used clay. Where did they find huge quantities of clay? Well, just around us. Look on our right. This big hill. 
You see the light brown color? That's clay. And we can see also that half of the hill is missing. Why? Because Glima. Because half of the mountain is missing because they need a lot of binding material. So when they were building this pyramid, they used the materials that they were laying around within a couple of kilometers radius. And they were building Giza pyramids. Besides limestone, they used granite from Aswan, which was 900 kilometers, 600 miles to the south. Imagine, to cut 20, 50 or even 220 tons blocks of granite and then move it from the desert to River Nile and through the River Nile all the way to the north to Giza and then again drag it through the desert. It was logistical nightmare, especially that they needed for one pyramid millions of tons of material. So the ancient builders here were much more practical. They had all the materials within a couple of kilometers radius. Now let's move on. The break is over. Another 50 stairs and we are there. See, it's in the pyramid. They will grow much, much faster, quicker, richer. Up to 300%. So, the pyramid energy is the next term that we are coming to. And it consists of not only electromagnetism, but also ultrasound, infrasound, Schumann resonance, and so on and so forth. So somebody in the past knew that the pyramid works with energy machine on different levels. Now, our energy beam, we measure the strength of the signal. So inside this frequency, 28 kilohertz, it can be different strength. And what we notice that, uh, and strength is shown in volts, we notice that as we are on the top, of the pyramid as we move higher the strength was getting stronger and stronger and stronger so now this is not something that's logical but like we concluded yesterday nothing in this country is logical so our pyramids work differently you move away signal is getting strong our technology is based on the fact that as you are closer to the source of the energy the uh, strength is of course bigger strong you move away it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker and then it disappears but here it's opposite so theoretically it would mean that this energy beam is get, if it is getting stronger and stronger and a matter of fact last year we did the experiment uh, we sent a drone 150 meters above the pyramid it was <coughs> even stronger and now this is shown on our uh, video on discovery channel we have one of our dvds for the tunnels with Discovery Channel episode on Bosnian Pyramids. So, if it goes stronger, theoretically, it could go through the ionosphere. That's one of the main problems with our rockets, how to, you know, leave our ionosphere. It could go through, it could go through our solar system, it can hit any other solar system, making an energy bridge. So, if you have Pyramidion, which is the pyramid top, which is missing here, by the way. It's <coughs> missing in case of Egyptian and Chinese pyramids. They were intentionally removed. If you remove important parts of the machine, it doesn't work properly anymore. So, if you can calibrate, if you can focus, if you can move this energy beam, then you can stay on the same point for 30 minutes or one hour, and, this, and through this energy bridge, you can start moving information, frequencies. Frequency is just information. So if you move information from point A to point B, then the pyramid becomes a very powerful communication device. Something more superior to what we have on this planet right now. <laughs> this one here. So, communication. You have a lot of energy, teleportation. <laughs> Agricultural uh, machine. Healing aspect with the proper frequencies so it works on several different levels and what's interesting is 
that the oldest pyramids on the planet in China, Egypt, Peru, Mexico, Bosnia are at the same time the biggest and the most superior. What does it tell us? The people who came later, like in Egypt, we really we had some pharaohs, 12th, 18th, 23rd dynasty, who were building pyramids. But from the mud brick, mud brick is very primitive, inferior material. They are not there anymore, but the oldest are still there. In China, the same thing. Some of the Chinese emperors tried to uh, make replica of the big pyramids, they don't have technology, they are much smaller, again, mud brick. So, obviously the knowledge has been brought. It opens more questions. Who brought this knowledge? From where? Same thing here. Who built this? How? Why? When? But if you're getting answers, when? 34,000 years ago. Who was here 34,000 years ago? When they teach us that until, like even today, in Bosnia, the Bosnian professors are saying 5,000 years ago it was primitive cavemen here. <laughs> well, if they agree with that, that's fine. One of the biggest critics, you know, that's a theological professor, the leading archaeology professor in Bosnia, he's the one who's basically saying that about 5,000 years ago, and cavemen, he's saying that, uh, you know, men came from monkeys and from apes and stuff like that. Well, if he thinks that, you know, his forefathers were monkeys, that's fine. <laughs> I will take that from him. <laughs>
concrete structure. So this should be the lower level. No, no they'll try to drop it. It will go to the land again. Yeah. Uh, the layers. Yes. Uh, you think there were layers above these? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I know. Or, or uh, okay. there are no. All right. Because of the different. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you what I know. The top obviously is salt. Why? Thousands of years, wind brings dust and soil and vegetation. Below, here we have one layer of concrete, another one, another one. Over there, we had four of them, those blocks. They are approximately 45 uh, to 40 centimeters each. So it's about 160, 170 centimeters. Four layers here. When it was there, these blocks are about 75 to, to 80 centimeters thick. And again, those two blocks, about 1 meter 60. Below them is a layer of clay. Below the clay, again, concrete block. Below clay. Below clay, sandstone block. Sandstone is very common construction material. A lot of sandstone here about. And they are all laid at 45 degrees, all the way to the top. This is what we do know. And then let's move a little bit, about 10 meters. Archaeologists cannot help us. Geologists, historians, anthropologists. Nobody really teaches them in school about the true purpose of pyramids. You know, they tell them, oh, there are tombs for pharaohs. They give no proofs for that, but they have to accept it, and that's it. Well, we said, in order to understand the pyramids, we need to get uh, experts in energy phenomena. Physicists, electrical engineers, sound engineers, people with the scientific instruments. Because when you come and measure, it's science. Archaeology, they see a piece of stone, oh, this is a tool or this is not a tool. Oh, it is from 5,000 or it is from 2,000 years. I mean, that's opinion. So, First we had a physicist from Zagreb, Slobodan Mizrak, who came with his 10-member team. He was measuring uh, electromagnetism on nearby hills, no anomalies. We were going around this pyramid, no anomalies, meaning the same very low electromagnetic field, no strength, really. The only little anomaly was the section on the top of this the section number five. And we know that from before it has a special energy, a little bit killing energy. But the rest of it, no anomalies, until he came to the very top. And there at the top, the place I'm going to show you on Friday, the radius of four and a half meters, he detected and measured electromagnetism of 28 kilohertz frequency. Now this frequency, as I told you yesterday, is the frequency that we measure inside the tunnels, inside all the tunnels. Three months later, um, Serbian electrical engineer Goran Marjanovic came, he measured the same thing, and then a uh, team from Finland and Italy, they all measured the same frequency at the top of the Sun Pyramid. They also concluded that uh, this uh, electromagnetism isn't going to the left or to the right on the surface of the tree, but it goes up. So it's like a form of the energy beam, electromagnetic beam. We also measured that. Uh, infrasound, ultrasound, and so on, and you will hear some of these phenomena tonight during the lecture. So now we have this beam coming to the top of the pyramid. Mother Nature does not make them, it means you have to have a machine to make this energy beam. So the pyramid is actually a machine. So we are standing not only on the biggest pyramidal structure on the planet, but also at the same time from behind. West, we were finding blocks like this one here. On the fourth one, southern side, we, did, we could not find them. Now, that side is not preserved anymore. As a matter of fact, here, the layer, of soil, the layer of soil is about one meter thick, over there, over ten meters. Why? There is a a huge earthquake in the past and we can see on the geological maps tectonic crack between this pyramid the sun and the one next to it on this photo 
behind me, the last pyramid. Probably that earthquake caused that blocks collapsed without the blocks, with only clay below, a lot more material accumulate. With 10 meters, it's like half size, half the height of this tree, you know, it got its little bit rounded shape. So this is, a, I would say, imperfect damaged pyramid. However, I'm going to show you some photos tonight, but you will see pyramids in Mexico or Guatemala or Honduras in much worse shape. I mean, totally destroyed. So, 2006, we started excavation. Wherever we excavate, we are finding these blocks. On this particular trench, which we called number 4C, when we removed about one meter of soil, we discovered this clearly rectangular block. Now, we could see that we have a flat surface. We have a break at 90 degrees. We have a flat side. We have break at 90 degrees. We have flat bottom. <coughs> so, we have four flat sides. And we have breaks at 90 degrees. Mother Nature does not make blocks like this one here. You have to have intelligent hand. Next to this block is another one, the one over here. Approximately it's located at the half of the side of the first one. Why did they place it like this? Hmm. Because of the structural stability. When we build today, we don't build like this, but like this, like that, like that. So the structure is more stable. <laughs> first, second, third. But below the first one is the second one, right here, and the third one. You see how the third one is a little bit moved? Again, because of structural stability, and the fourth one. So what we have here is a structure, is a construction. Mother Nature does not construct, but intelligent hands. Now, look at this material here. Look at these stones. Remember yesterday when we were in the tunnels, I was showing you stones with different colors. Here we have white and gray and blue. We have uh, again gray. We have reddish color, green, different colors and different sizes. Bigger, medium, smaller. So when they removed thousands of tons of material from the tunnel, they used it to make these blocks. All they needed was a binder. This material in between. This brownish, grayish material. Clay. Which they found from the place where I just showed you. When we did the analysis, we found also granite powder. Why would they use granite powder? Mm -hmm. They use it as the additive to get a hardness, a harder material. In Mexico, they were using shells. In Egypt, they were using eggshells. Why? <coughs> Calcium carbonate. Now, we sent samples of this material to seven different institutes for material. The Czech Republic, in Prague, in France, in Italy, in Bosnia. And they to all told us that this was some type of the concrete in more sophisticated institutes in Prague and France, they said it was geopolymer concrete. Geopolymer is a method, a technique used during the ancient times. For example, using clay as the binder was a common practice in ancient Rome 2000 years ago. But here we have usage from much, much before. Now, when it comes to concrete, there are two properties that determine the quality of concrete. The first one is hardness. Harder the concrete, the better the quality. The second one is water absorption. Higher water absorption, it's worse quality. You need to have very low water absorption. So, hardness. Our concrete today are in the range from 10 to 60 megapascals. 60 megapascals are the best quality concrete. 
This conflict here, from 73 to 134 megapascals. So it's two, even three times better quality than the best concrete we can make in 21st century. It tells us a lot about the technology of the ancient builders. The second property, water absorption. If during the winter times, water gets inside those blocks, it freezes and concrete breaks. So the idea is to keep the absorption as low as possible. Today we allow up to 3%. These are our standards. This concrete here, 1%. Superior. Well, if it is so superior, how come we have those pieces of concrete blocks? Until uh, 10 years ago, people consider this a natural hill. They come, they dig, they find those big blocks. Now, nobody really lived below. Nobody wanted to buy this land. It was worthless for them. Because you have a slope of 44, 43 degrees. At this slope, you cannot do your agriculture. You cannot keep your domestic animals. So from the farmer's point of view, it was worthless. So the land, is mostly gotten by the gypsies. On our way here, I was showing you the whole gypsy village, those beggars, gypsies. They get the land basically for free. So now they need to build houses. Of course, they don't have money. So what they do, they dig a little bit and they find blocks like this. This is seven tons, 16,000 pounds. It's too heavy for them. So what they would do, they would come with the dynamite, put it right here, blow everything up. And they were getting smaller pieces. They take smaller pieces and they throw them to their foundation. So unfortunately, some large sections of pyramid have been destroyed forever because of gypsies. I even had some when we started excavation ten, nine, ten years ago telling me, hey, yeah, yeah, I know this is a quarry, we were getting material for our houses. So they were destroying it for decades. Very unfortunate, but nothing new in humanity. I mean, look at the Egyptian pyramids, Giza pyramids. They were all covered by that nice whitish layer of granite. It's gone now. They built palaces and mosques and homes in Cairo. Look at Mexico, look at Peru. Even today in Peru, what they do, when they developed certain land, they destroy the pyramid with the adobe bricks because it is on their way. Look what they do in Guatemala two years ago. They destroy the pyramid to get the shaped volcanic stone so they can build their structures. So we do not respect what we find here from our ancestors. Now, we are coming also to the question of the age of the pyramid. How old is this structure? How we can figure that one out? The first way is we can see that they are covered by soil. If we can get the age of the soil, how old is the soil, then we can get the minimum age of the structure. The science that investigates the soil is called pedology. We have Institute for Pedology here in Sarajevo, in Bosnia. So they came voluntarily. They don't, didn't even ask me in 2006. They came to the Sun Pyramid, they took samples from different places, they went to the Moon Pyramid, which you're going to see tomorrow, they took samples of the soil above the structure. Their conclusion was that the age of the soil is between 12 and 15,000 years. So if the soil is 15,000 years, it means that the structure is much older, but that was first very good indication for us. Of course, more precise method is called radiocarbon dating. You find organic material, it can be a piece of wood, of animal bone, organic material, and then you can get the age of the structure if it was found there. When we were uncovering the section over there, which we called 4A, which you're going to see later on, with the big boulders, some of them are 
regularly square boulders. We removed about one meter of soil and clay and below the soil and on the top of the concrete block we discovered a fossilized leaf in 2012 by Italian archaeologist Nicola Visconti. I will show you photos tonight during my lecture. And that fossilized leaf can give us again the minimum age of the structure because it means that once the structure was uncovered the wind brought the leaf it remained there covered by dust and salt. Well that leaf was 25,800 years plus minus 200 years so 26,000 years. And finally in 2013 our archaeological manager Tim Moon was working on different sections which I'm going to show you today also and between two layers of concrete the first and second like between two rows inside like in a sandwich he discovered two pieces of fossilized leaves meaning that they get there during the construction phase putting all those concrete blocks or putting them at the side the leaves came remained there and they got fossilized their age 29,200 years plus minus 400 years but this is radiocarbon date calendar date is approximately 15 percent more so it is about 34,000 years and these are exactly the dates we are finding in the tunnels, over 30,000 years. So now we go in the very deep past. Of course, what they teach us in schools is that everything started with Sumerians, and then Babylon, and Akkad, Assyria, ancient Egypt, 8,000 years ago. And this is just the last civilizational cycle. For this one, another one, another one and another approximately 12,500 years ago one civilization we can see the layers here right uh-huh nice